Labas rytas. Čia bet veikiausiai pusvienintelį žodžių, kurios aš lietuviškai šį kartą pasakysiu. Tai jums leidus perisiu prie anglų kalbos, kadangi angliškai šį diskusiją bus. So, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you here on behalf of Vilnius Institute for Policy Analysis, a young think tank. And today we gathered here to discuss a world without facts or a post-truth world as it is described now. I would like to start this uh, conversation with uh, Mr. Edward Lucas quoting one quotation which sounds, I saw great battles reported where there had been no fighting and complete silence where hundreds of men had been killed. I saw troops who had fought bravely denounced as coverts and traitors and others who had never seen a shot fired hailed as the heroes of imaginary victories and I saw newspapers in London retailing those lies and eager intellectuals building superstructures over events that had never happened. I saw, in fact, history being written not in terms of what had happened, but of what ought to have happened, according to various party lines. That's a quote of George Orwell coming from the 30s as he participated in the Spanish Civil War. So my main question, do we face the same problems or we just, or there is something new in this uh, informational warfare. Uh, and I give also floor to my colleague, Simas. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our main guest at this festival. It's uh, Edward Lucas, a, one of the most well-known and uh, well-regarded British journalists and uh, Vladimir Putin's critics. Uh, many of you have pr probably read or uh, at least heard about his 2008 book, um, The New uh, Cold War, Putin's Russia and the Threat to the West, uh, which was actually um, you know, not so seriously taken at that time in the West as it should have been. But it recently, uh, a new edition of the book was launched in the West as the Western experts have finally realized that Lucas was right about Putin from the very beginning. Or as uh, Edward himself often stresses, the West should have paid much more attention to the warnings uh, about Russia coming from the Baltic states and Eastern Europe and listen to experts from these frontline countries. Since then, Edward, has written a book about Russia's espionage uh, activities in the West and another about cybersecurity. And now he's finishing a book about the way modern technology greatly enhances espionage capabilities. Edward is a senior editor at The Economist and a non-resident fellow at SIPA, a think tank in Washington, D.C. Um, so, now, Edward will speak for about 20 minutes, and then me and Donatas will ask several questions. And finally, we will have some time for the questions from the audience. So let's give a very warm round of applause to Edward Lucas. And thanks for coming here. Thank you very much, Seamus, and thank you also, Donatus, for the excellent quote from George Orwell to get us, get us going. Um, we don't have unlimited time here, but I am around in the afternoon as well, so please just, if you want to ask me a question later, just grab me and um, ask me, and I will try and, I'll try and, try and answer, answer it. I think the point of the George Orwell quote is a very good one, that this is not a new problem. We've had government propaganda uh, since the era of mass communication started. Uh, that's, that's, that's not new. And we've had bad journalism ever since journalism started. That's not new either. But I think there are two new factors which have come into play uh, which make our difficulties a bit more um, more serious. The first is the internet, 
which brings anonymity and immediacy to news in a way that we didn't have before. In the old days, if you wanted to do government propaganda, you used the printing press or the shortwave radio. Now you can set up a website on the other side of the world, make it look like an authentic news outlet, and use it to send information into another country's political system. And nobody can be sure that it's you that is doing that. So this anonymity and immediacy is, is a really new factor. And the other is that we have a big social change, which is that we are more questioning of authority. And that's broadly a good thing. I like the fact that individuals are skeptical and asking questions about information and asking questions about the way in which decisions are made. But this means that you can no longer say, this is true because the BBC says it. This is true because the New York Times says it. People are naturally um, more skeptical, and we have to work much harder to get their trust. And we've not succeeded, I would say, in journalism and in other elite circles in getting the trust of the public in the way that we need them. So I'm not sure we are in a post-truth era, but I think we are moving into a much more low-trust era. And that makes things difficult for us and to some extent makes things easier for the people who are attacking us, like Putin. Now, I think, as I said, we're not really in a post-truth world and we're also not in a fact-free world. Facts really are there. And as George Orwell wrote in his book, 1984, when Winston Smith is being interrogated, two plus two really does equal four. Two plus two is not five, whatever um, Big Brother says. So I do believe in facts and in logic. Um, and I think, as we all know from studying maths and science at school, these things are really... Um, irreducible. You can um, argue about philosophy and political science, um, but thing, we, the, the thing, things really do happen. Lithuania really was occupied. Stalin really was the leader of the Soviet Union. He really did die. Lithuania really did become independent again in 1991. And these are real facts. Um, and however much people want to um, argue about the interpretation. We have to stick to the idea that um, some historical, uh, historical facts are historical facts. But that doesn't help us when we are dealing with this state-sponsored spon propaganda. We see really mystifying uh, historical interpretations coming sponsored by the Kremlin, which argue that black is white and that two plus two equals five. And these may not have so much of an effect here in Lithuania because people here have lived the history of the region and they understand what totalitarianism means and how precious democracy and freedom and independence are. But they do have effects um, elsewhere in the West. And we see these Kremlin narratives are affecting the way people look at the war in Ukraine, the way they look at uh, the Putin regime, the way they look at NATO, the way they look at deterrence, um, the way they look at the history of the Cold War, and so on. And they, they have an effect. And so we have, and this is the subject for today, really, we have to decide what we can, what we can do about this. And there's a dilemma, because if you engage with these fake narratives and start arguing with them, to some extent, you're also legitimizing them. And you get dragged into a battlefield um, where you are arguing about whether 2 plus 2 equals 5 or 2 plus 2 equals 4. And this immediately gives an advantage to the other side. Something that should be uncontestable becomes a subject of debate. And because in the West we have moved into an era where we prize fairness very much over truth, people say, well, this is an interesting debate. The, P the Kremlin says that 2 plus 2 is 5, and Lithuania says 2 plus 2 is 4. Well, maybe there is something to be said on both sides. Let's take a neutral and fair-minded position. We see this very clearly over Ukraine, where you have, um, and I'm often invited onto radio and onto television in Britain to debate with Russian propagandists, and they say, well, 
Crimea was never really part of Ukraine. Um, there was a referendum. They voted to join Russia. And this is the 2 plus 2 equals 5 approach. And I'm there saying 2 plus 2 equals 4. And so I sometimes say to the editors of these programs, if you were discussing geography and you had someone who said the Earth was round, you wouldn't feel the need to balance this debate by having someone who says the Earth is flat. If you had a program where you were discussing astronomy, you wouldn't feel the need to balance that program by having someone who also believed in astrology to balance the astronomer. And so I think it's right to start off always by pushing back against this kind of moral equivalence, this belief that fake facts are the same as real facts, that fake news is the same as real news. And we can complain about this, we can write letters and emails, we can make phone calls. Um, people in my position um, can do quite a lot. And I've sometimes succeeded in saying that if you have this Russian propagandist on your program, I won't debate with him. You can have him on first, you can have me on second, and then I will say that he was a Russian propagandist and I'll be rude about him. If you put us on together, I will also be rude about him. Um, but don't expect a normal debate between the astronomer and the astrologer. So that's one response. I think another thing, we ha another approach we have to adopt is of humility and transparency. We have to accept that the new generation that's coming up didn't live the same historical experience that we did. I remember the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. My parents remember the Second World War. Um, my uh, brothers and sisters remember the fall of the Berlin Wall. All this is real stuff for us. But my children's generation don't remember that, and we need to start from a position that we have to persuade each new generation um, that these things really happened. And we have to make an effort to do that. We have to teach the history in the schools. We have to have programs on our public television. We have to make this part of our, of our narrative, of the history of our countries, and always keep on uh, putting these um, facts out into the public. We can't assume that just because they're true, people are going to believe them. And we have to assume that they will be challenged. And we have to be, have good answers to these questions. So if people say, hang on, didn't the Estonians and Latvians um, fight as the SS divisions alongside the Nazis? Well, we have to say, um, that didn't happen quite like that. You've got the history a bit wrong. If people say Lithuanians collaborated in the Holocaust, we have to have an answer to that. People will, this is, these are arguments that our enemies are making. They're taking elements of historical truth and twisting them. And we won't win, win simply by walking away from the argument, however unfair it is. So we need to have FAQs, frequently answered questions. We need to have fact sheets. We need always to be looking at Wikipedia pages and other sources of information to make sure that our side of the story and the real side of the story is properly told. But I, I think we have to be careful not to overdo this because I said we don't want to get into an argument on their terms. We have our own story to tell and it's better than their story. We shouldn't be dragged off into a battlefield which is not of our choosing. I think we also have to counterattack, and this is um, very important. We counterattack where we choose to counterattack in a battlefield which is our choosing. And we have lots of weapons there. One of them is humor and satire. And I think when they say something that is particularly ridiculous, we should make fun of it. I love this um, Facebook page in support of Vaishnoria, this made up country which is part of the scenario for Zapad. I'm a strong supporter of Vaishnoria, and I will defend Vaishnoria against um, foreign aggression. I will support them on Twitter, and I will do everything I can to promote Vaishnoria. And I encourage you all to do the same thing. This is um, a, an opportunity that the Kremlin has given us. I also, if there's anyone here who has connections with Ujopis, I recommend that the Republic of Ujopis immediately opens diplomatic relations with Vaishnoria 
in order to defend it. Um, I love the thing that the, um, this, uh, the, the Vilnius Institute has done of highlighting um, the invented Russian propaganda things, the building that never caught fire, the bomb that never went off, the guy who never existed. This is very good. We need to use humor and satire on our side to make fun of them because um, ridicule is a really powerful weapon against the pomposity and absurdity and lies of the Putin regime. And the third thing, which I think is a very powerful weapon, which is something that we, we've not really started at all at the moment, is to be much more questioning about sources. Where is this information coming from? Because the trouble is there is no clear dividing line between good journalism and bad journalism, and there is no clear dividing line between bad journalism and propaganda. At the extremes, you can say this is clearly propaganda, this is clearly bad journalism, but there's an awful lot of stuff which is mixed. Sites like Bolt News, for example, or Sputnik, have a mixture of stories that are real stories, stories that are bad, bad journalism but have an element of truth, and stories that are outright propaganda. And so we are always, it's always going to be difficult to draw a dividing line. And although we can try, we won't be very, I think we won't be very successful in this. But what we can do is to be much more critical about the sources of news. And there are some really good tests here that we can apply, which I think we, we, we can be much better in doing, which give very powerful answers that help us in dealing with fake news and fake facts. And the first of these, if we are looking at any news source, is to ask, does it have a connection in the real world? Now, if you go to Delphi, or to The Economist, or to The New York Times, or to LRT, or any of these Lithuanian news sources or Western news sources, you will see an address. You will see the name of a responsible editor. There will probably be a phone number. There will be a way of making contact. And so you can be sure that even if there is a mistakes there, things you don't agree with, there's someone you can complain to. This is the online manifestation of a real-world news organization, and there are real people working there. They have names. You can Google them. Maybe they exist on Twitter or Facebook or some other um, uh, form of social media. And you can meet them in a small country like Lithuania. You can go up to them in a bar or in a meeting like this and say, hey, I liked your story, or hey, I didn't like your story. And so this is part of real journalism. But a lot of these fake news outlets don't have that. Um, if you go to the website, it maybe has no way of making contact. There may be just one journalist named there, and sometimes when you check him out, he doesn't really exist. It's just a fake photo borrowed from somewhere else. Um, if you ask for the phone number, there's no phone number. And this is a very big warning sign that we should be not taking these news sources seriously. If you go, and I think that Twitter and Facebook and Google and the other sites that we use in order to reach our ultimate destination should do a much better job in warning us. If you go on Google to a site which has malware, you get a big red screen saying, danger, this site may infect your computer. Proceed with caution. It doesn't stop you going there, but it will advise you very strongly not to go there. And I think it would be quite easy, and I'm, I'm talking to Google and Facebook and Twitter about this right now, it'd be quite easy for them to say, hey, this news site looks like a news site, but actually it has no real world media existence. There's no street address, there's no person involved, there's no phone number, there's no way of making contact. These are very powerful tests. Um, it's not something that people who use the website will necessarily go and find out for themselves because we are in a hurry. And maybe if you just Google something and you click on a link and it takes you to a story and you read it and you don't have time to go the, to the site which says about us or apiamusu or on us or whatever it supposedly gives, the, gives the, um, the story about who is actually behind this new site. So that's one powerful test. 
Another one is to ask who's paying for this. Who paid for this news to come into existence? So it's very interesting if you go to RT, for example, or Sputnik, they don't really have advertisements. Advertisements are a sign of a healthy media economy. Subscriptions are a sight of a healthy media economy. If this news is coming free of charge, with no subscriptions, then you have to ask, who is paying for this? It's another very powerful test. And if someone's paying for it, what's their agenda? A third one, which I think is perhaps the most powerful test of all, and I'll finish on this point so we get on to discussions, is does this website that reports the news or claims to report the news ever admit it's made a mistake? Now, I've spent more than 30 years as a journalist. I've worked for the BBC. I've worked for The Economist. I've worked for um, big British papers, for American news outlets. And I know that mistakes are part of journalism. You cannot do honest journalism without making mistakes. There may be small mistakes, and there may be big mistakes, <coughs> but there will be mistakes. And to me, the biggest test of good journalism is how you deal with your mistakes. Obviously, it's good to minimize the number of mistakes and to have fact checkers and try and catch the mistakes before they come out. And so I like it when I see there's only a small number of mistakes rather than a large number of mistakes. But even more important than that is what happens when you make a mistake. Do you correct the mistake? Do you print a reader's letter saying, hey, you got that wrong? Do you print a reader's letter giving the alternative point of view, saying your piece was unfair? Do you print an apology? Do you say, hey, we got this wrong, we're sorry. We said it was millions, it was billions. We said it was Iran, it was actually Iraq. We said it was 1991, it was 1993. Or maybe bigger mistakes. Do we say we apologize, the reporting on this was unethical, our source was wrong. These are really important questions. And it's one of the things that I like very much about The Economist and about The New York Times and about the BBC and other big news organizations, that we take mistakes really, really seriously. You can go to our websites and you can find apologies, corrections, clarifications, letters to the editor, all these signs that we are trying to deal with the mistakes. And what's really interesting is if you go to these fake news sites, these propaganda sites, Sputnik, RT, Bolt News, let alone Regnum Tochka Ru, uh, all these other ones which, are, which we, you, you, we, we all know about, you will almost never find a correction or an apology. And that's a sign of really bad journalism. It's very interesting. I, I spent a long time going through the RT website for a research project trying to find any case where they'd corrected or apologized. I only found one, and this is your homework project. You can go and do this afterwards. Go through the RT website and see if you can find the only apology you've ever, that they've ever, um, they've ever published and see if you can work out why they did it. It's very instructive. So that's a little bit of uh, homework between now and next year when I hope to come back to Bershtina so you can tell me if you, if you found it. So this is a very powerful test. And we can educate people through media literacy campaigns and so on to be more questioning about this. We don't expect them to believe everything we say, but we can ex say to them, believe our good faith, because when we get it wrong, we own up to our mistakes. And that's the real difference between our media environment, our media system, our media ecology, and Vladimir Putin's. He may have stories that are accurate. We may have stories that are wrong. He, he may have some quite good arguments. We may have some quite bad arguments. But fundamentally, in our system, our system has contestability. When we get things wrong, we try and put them right. In his system, when they get things wrong, they don't admit it, and they try and cover it up. And I think that's the fundamental difference between our system and theirs, between our med our, their political system and our political system, between our media system and their media system. And so I hope that by applying these tools, we may be able to get somewhere in fighting back against this epidemic of fake facts and fake news. And I really look forward to your questions. Thank you very much indeed.
Thank you, Edward. Uh, I would like to share a short my personal story and ask about uh, um, how to react to the Russian propaganda or actually uh, the mistakes that we do. When the Ukrainian war, uh, the war in Ukraine started, I got a call from one international school and they asked me to come and speak to the students about uh, tolerance. The problem there was uh, that uh, there was a considerable uh, Russian minority standing there and the children got accused, yeah, you are the fifth column, you are the Putin uh, children, you, you started the war in Ukraine, you, you are fighting, so I had to go and explain that the children are not guilty. So it's just uh, like a clear example of, of, of one of the mistakes that we do while uh, answering the Russia's uh, propaganda, but I would like to ask you more about, the, my, my main aim is actually, uh, I. I Quoted like this: How, fight, how, when we are fighting Putin, how not to become like Putin <laughs> in answering him? Well, this is a great question, and it gets into a much wider problem of how we fight hybrid war, because the threat we face from Putin is not just fake news; it's the combination of fake news and military pressure, economic pressure espionage, psychological warfare, and the way in which Russia uses every bit of the Russian system, whether it's the courts, the military, the intelligence services, Gazprom and the energy exporters, Russian banks, Russian diplomats, every part of the Russian spectrum can be used in support of Russian foreign policy objectives. And they don't have the professional and ethical boundaries that we have. There's no real difference in the Russian system between a diplomat, an intelligence officer, a journalist, someone in the energy business, an academic, a lawyer. They're all on the same side, and they hop between these different roles quite freely. And in our system, we have ethical constraints, and we have boundaries, we have um, structures, and we want to keep those. And so if we are trying to fight this Putinist hybrid threat, a joined up threat. How do we do this without Putinizing our own society? It's a really big, difficult problem. I don't want to live in a, in, in a country where the intelligence service tells me as a journalist what to write. I don't want to live in a country where the government tells the energy companies what to do in order to promote foreign policy. I don't want to have this sort of Putinist arrangements, but we are under an attack from a country which has a competitive advantage over us because they adopt these tactics. So you're absolutely right to worry about this. How do we fight Putinist propaganda without adopting Putinist tactics? And so I don't like the idea we respond with censorship. I think that we have a free and open media system, and I don't like the idea that we say this television society, channel is banned because we don't like it as propaganda. I don't like the idea we say this person can't speak because what they're saying is propaganda. But these are real dilemmas. We have to engage with them and we have to work out very clearly what are the rules in our society? What are the rules set by parliament? What are the rules set by our media regulators? We have to discuss those rules honestly and fairly and then we have to enforce them. So in my country, in Britain, we have a rule about fairness in broadcast media. And RT breaks that rule. And it breaks it pretty systematically. And so our media regulator, Ofcom, said to RT, first of all, you are breaking the fairness and balance rule in your coverage of Ukraine. First warning. They carried on doing it. Second warning. Next stage is we will take them off air for three months and they won't be able to broadcast in Britain um, on our cable and satellite networks for three months. That's the penalty. We've warned them. It's very fair. So I think that's, that's the approach. Now, in, I know in Lithuania you've taken a Russian channel off air. So I think so long as you have made the rules very clear, you've discussed them, debated them, put them into force democratically, and you're applying them according to the rules, and everybody knows what the rules are, well, then that's fine. And, and sometimes the result of that is, no, you cannot be on our airwaves. You cannot be on our cable television. You cannot um, be in our media space. And so I'd say in, 
in, in the example you give, it's absolutely fine to have Russians in the audience. Maybe they're on our side. It's absolutely fine to have hostile questions. If they ask hostile questions, we will give them good answers. If they start intimidating the rest of the audience, if they start doing as George Orwell's uh, sheep did in Animal Farm, shouting four legs good, two legs bad, to try and drown out critical views, well, then we have to be tough. And I've been at meetings in London where the large numbers of Russian propagandists have turned up, and they've tried to dominate the meeting. They don't let other people speak. Um, they talk at great length and don't stop talking. And in the end, I've had to say to the stewards, excuse me, if you carry on like this, we're going to remove these people here. And if you carry on for long enough, we will have you physically ejected from the meeting because that's the rule of the meeting. You have to be democratic in your behavior. So you're absolutely right. We have to be tolerant. We have to be kind. We have to be fair in our dealings with Russians when they ask questions and when they contribute. But we shouldn't forget this is our system and these are our rules. We set the rules fairly and we implement them fairly. And in the end, that may mean that um, Russian propagandists can't do what they want. I would like to quote uh, one passage from Edward Lucas's book, uh, Deception, which was published in 2011. Um, the current approach in the West of engagement without willpower is certain to make matters worse, not better. The West hardly realizes that it is dealing with an adversary that understands us better than we know ourselves, whose goals and methods are mysteries to us and whom we barely recognize when we see him. He is determined, we are divided. He is resentful and paranoid. We are complacent, complacent and trusting. We want to like him. We hope he will like us and eventually be like us. He wants nothing of the kind, end quote. So I would like to ask, uh, has anything changed since 2011? Is, it, is Russia still in advance in all layers of its engagement with the West? Well, thank you. It's very flattering having um, my book read out, and it's available in Lithuanian if you want to read it in, in, in Lithuanian. Um, I think that the West is waking up, and I think it depends very much where you look. But when I wrote The New Cold War in 2007, I was really frightened by how the West was failing to appreciate the threat from Putin and was failing to listen to people like you, the Estonians and Latvians and Lithuanians and Poles and Czechs and Ukrainians and others who were warning us, and those warnings were just not being listened to. They weren't being listened to in the European Union. They weren't being listened to in NATO. They weren't being listened to in Washington or in London or in Berlin, and particularly not in Berlin or in Paris or in other big Western capitals. So I was really... I was, I was really angry and, and quite frightened about what was happening. And we just had the, the cyber attack on Estonia, the bronze soldier riots, and the West was really not responding properly, I felt. And since then, I think there's been a, a very substantial change. Um, the European Union has done a really good job on energy. When I wrote the, um, the New Cold War, Europe didn't have an energy strategy. Now we have the third energy package. Lithuania, under the Kubilius government, did a really, really good job on unbundling energy here. And you have effective energy independence. Go down the road to the LNG terminal at Klaipeda, and you can see the physical expression of this. This is really, really important. Um, Poland is doing the same. You know, Russia's ability to use gas as a weapon is very severely blunted now. There are a few places in southeastern Europe. Bulgaria has a real problem. But this era of what I used to call the abominable gas man is over. That's really important. Um, NATO has got its act together. You have the German-led 
um, enhanced forward presence here in Lithuania, the Canadians in Latvia, the Americans across the border in Poland, and the Brits in Estonia. This would have been unthinkable 10 years ago. 10 years ago, NATO did not even have contingency plans to defend the Baltic states because they were worried that this would be seen as a hostile act towards Russia. We have the NATO Stratcom Center in Riga, and we have NATO taking strategic communications and propaganda really seriously. There's a big NATO conference in Valencia next week, which I'm speaking at. That would have been inconceivable 10 years ago. It's all about strategic communications and propaganda. We have um, very substantial um, interest now in Germany, in Britain, in France, and in America in the threat from Russia. This is all really good. I think what hasn't yet changed is some parts of the European Union bureaucracy, particularly the European External Action Service. I think Mrs. Mogherini could still do a lot more on this. I think in Southern Europe, things are still very difficult. And outside government in Germany, things are still very difficult. Um, go to a German university and try and have the sort of conversation we're having here, and you'll have people reacting in a very hostile way. They'll say, this is Cold War propaganda. Why are you wasting our time with this um, old-fashioned staff we need Dialog statt Konfrontation, a very phrase the Germans love, this Kantian approach that if we could only all be reasonable, everything would be all right. And I just wish that they would read that chapter from Deception. Um, and I, I think it is changing in Germany, but it's still got a long way to go. So I'm not nearly as pessimistic as I was um, when I wrote those two books. Um, but I also think the Russian threat has evolved. Russia is doing things better and it's doing things differently. So we have dealt with one part of the Russian arsenal. They're now trying new things and some things that we still find it very hard to, very hard to understand. Um, recently I was reading a book uh, by Ivan Krastev, After Europe, and in his book, uh, Krastev makes an interesting point. He says uh, that uh, in some countries we see that uh, ideological class divisions are disappearing, melting, but the interesting phenomenon happen happens that uh, conspiracy theories replace ideologies as a mobilizing, uniting force, as, and as one of the examples, he speaks about uh, Poland, about the Smolensk tragedy, and it brings us to the question of Russia again, because uh, on the part of uh, um, peace, uh, they say that uh, Kremlin was involved in the catastrophe, uh, part of the Polish elite also helped to hide it. Uh, uh, and my question is, uh, I understand there is a danger to underestimate uh, Russian uh, propaganda, disinformation, uh, informational warfare. But uh, other, on the other hand, don't you think that there is also a danger to overestimate it and uh, see Russia everywhere, like here behind us probably, <laughs> or behind my question <laughs> now, uh, that we see Russia never, everywhere and then we can explain everything while just uh, speaking about uh, Kremlin. Yes, well, you're absolutely right, and it's one of the, I think that ultimately conspiracy theories result from a feeling of powerlessness, and that if you feel that, whether it's the, the CIA or the Kremlin or the Jews or the Freemasons or the Illuminati or Bilderberg or Soros or, you know, I'm grateful to our sponsors, by the way, but you know, someone out there is really, really powerful, and they can do anything they want, and they will never be noticed. You know, this, this is an expression of a kind of political pathology, um, which then results in these conspiracy theories, and you start trying to join the dots in a way that makes sense of, um, of, your, of your life. And the answer to all these theories is to have um, people feeling a sense of agency, that what they do matters, that they matter as a worker, they have rights with their employer, as a consumer they have rights over what they, um, over what they buy, as a political being they have rights, that their vote matters, that their political representatives take them seriously, 
that as a subject of the legal system, they also have rights. If they, something goes wrong, they can go to court, that they have um, rights in, as, to express their cultural identity. The more people feel empowered in all these different parts of their existence, then the less likely they are to believe that there is some secret conspiracy that bosses everybody around because they say, you know what, I am the master of my destiny. I do what I want and I make and I have rights, I have duties and I am the, the focus of my, of, of, of my existence and my relationship with other people is what really, really matters to me. Um, but we don't have that and I think one of the good points that Ivan, my friend Ivan Krastev makes in his book is that we have serious problems in the way our political system works. And I think one of the big mistakes we made after 1991 was assuming that because communism had failed, that the Western political system was absolutely perfect. Now, I grew up in the Western political system, and I spent a lot of my time trying to change it and trying to improve it, because I could absolutely see that it wasn't perfect. And I think we need to recover a sense of ambition to try and improve our democracy and our rule of law and our economic system and so on. We shouldn't just say, thank goodness it isn't communism. We should say we want it to be better. And I'm very encouraged by some of the um, new thinking I see, not least in places like Poland, to try and um, you know, to enrich and improve, improve democracy. So we should be very ambitious about this and very questioning and try, uh, trying to make things, um, make things better. But I think absolutely Russia loves conspiracy theories. And one of the great paradoxes of Poland, and I'll finish on this, is that the most passionate anti-communists in Poland, I think, are falling into a Kremlin trap by propagating this idea of the Smolensk conspiracy. And this disempowers Poles. It brings back all the bad old memories of, 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 of Russian domination. It makes Poles disbelieve in their, in their own system. It makes them believe that um, the system, system, or that at least the previous government, was a bunch of liars and traitors and spies and crooks and murderers. So it has terrible effects on the Polish national psyche. And, and I'm really amazed that these really super patriotic people like Antony Macerewicz and, and Kaczynski and others encourage this. It's, it's in importing a kind of political pathology into the system, which has very bad and, act, and also very divisive, very polarizing effects. Now, of course, bad things happen. Catastrophes happen. Disasters happen. So you, put a, you have an inquiry. Make sure it's an honest inquiry. Answer all the questions. Dig up all the facts. Produce a report and move on. That's what healthy countries do. That's what we did with the 9-11 um, in, in, in America. And you should continue to carry on asking questions. If new evidence comes up, well, answer it. Be honest. Say, yes, we screwed up. The autopsies weren't very good. Um, a lot of the bodies came back in the wrong coffins. Yeah, well, it was, you know, these things happen in, in, plane, in, in plane crashes. But we should be, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's just great for the Kremlin. The longer this carries on, the more Poland is distracted and divided, and the easier it is for Russia, Russia to do the things that, that, that are actually on Russia's hidden agenda. We have some time for questions. Um, do any of you have any questions or comments? I should be really disappointed if we have no questions from the audience, particularly as I see some familiar and friendly faces here who I'm sure will be able to ask something. Yes, there's a lady there who's got a hand up. Can you stand up, please? Because if you stand up, then they wouldn't know where the microphone should go to. Hello. Um, I'm Sabo Ejpogoni from the Central European University. And, um, Can you speak up? Uh, we don't... Hear Louder. Right oh, into oh, the I'm microphone. Sorry. Okay. So um, um, you started out your presentation with um, acknowledging the importance of questioning authorities. Um, but then you went on and said that we... You encourage Google, Twitter, Facebook, and all these internet giants to orient people at least and uh, warn them of suspicious content. How should we trust these companies? So um, shall we say that we trust, we entrust Google and Facebook with deciding what counts as fake news 
or suspicious news, um, to what extent would be this in line with our basic democratic principles? Well, thanks, Sabots, for your, for your question, and also congratulations on all the great work you do in Budapest, despite the government's attempts to close you down. I don't want, I don't want to get into a discussion about content here, because I, I certainly don't trust Google, Facebook, or Twitter to make decisions about what's good journalism, what's bad journalism, what's bad journalism, and what's propaganda. I want to keep them right out of, out of that discussion. All I'm asking for is some very simple tests about the real world connection of these sites. And that's pretty binary. If you do a who, I mean, I guess everybody here is familiar with the who is function on the internet. You, do a, you go to a, a who is um, site, you put in ALF, .lt or economist.com or Svedbank or what, any other site you like, and you can see how did this site get onto the internet. And it will give you, usually, it will give you a street address. It will give you a phone number. It will say, this is the website of The Economist Newspaper Limited, and our address is the Adelphi Building, John Adams Street, London, and it'll give our phone number. That's the kind of normal thing. Sometimes you won't have a phone number. It'll just be a street address because people don't want endless phone calls from people trying to sell them things. But there's a, there's a pretty clear picture of what a real registration looks like. And if you go to these fake news sites, there's no registration. They've bought the space on the server with a prepaid debit card or with some other electronic cash or Bitcoin or something. There's literally no real-world contact. So they fail the who is test. That's strike number one. Strike number two, is there an address actually on the website? If there isn't, well, that's strike number two. Number three, do they have real people? Is there anybody named as the editor-in-chief or the owner or something like that? Again, that's a very pretty easy test. And I think that you can publish these rules and say this is very binary. You know, you either succeed or you don't. And if Google and Facebook and Twitter and the others simply say, according to this test, which you could say would be you know, produced by the Open Society Foundation, it's produced by um, some independent, transparent media, you know, maybe the Council of Europe or some, some other well-respected neutral institution, could say, this is the test of real worldliness. We've discussed it. We've taken public consultation. We've decided these are the tests. You have to get at least two out of three to pass. And then you could, you, the, the people who provide us with the links and who we, with the sites where we click on links can say, it failed. You can still go there. We're not saying you can't go there. Maybe there's a very good reason why it's anonymous. Maybe it's a Chechen human rights site. Maybe it's somewhere in the Tibetan, um, you know, or Syria opposition or Turkish opposition. So there may be a very good reason why it's anonymous, but at least you can highlight you know, someone is trying to keep something secret about that. And then you, as the reader, can draw your own conclusion. Do I want to go or do I want not to go? But at least you know this is not the same as a new site that is absolutely rooted in the real world. Lady in the front? Lady at the back first, then the lady at the front. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for coming here today as well. Um, so it's really important to unpack those lies, and external action service and NATO, they've been doing a great job. But also, if you look at the psychological um, articles, that there is a difference between being uninformed and misinformed. And if someone is in, misinformed and truly believes that uh, conspiracy theory, some kind of lie. If you present them facts, there have been tests performed that those people would defend more fiercely what they believe in, which is a lie. Um, so my question to you would be, would you advise us to engage with these people who are misinformed and try to convince them to show them statistics, the sources, or just see that this is a lost cause and focus on those who um, might still be in the gray area and might believe the truth. Thank you. Well, you know, I still meet people who believe in communism. 
I, st I, mean, I literally, I meet people in, um, people not, not only in Britain but elsewhere who feel that, that basically the, the Cold War was won by the wrong side, communism would have worked if it had been tried properly, and all this, everything we believe is just anti-Soviet propaganda. So there's always going to be people who will believe in defiance of all facts and all logic, and there's nothing, you, know, you, you can't expect to win them all. Um, but most people change their views over time, and I think that you have to provide a steps and scaffolding for people to climb down from their mistakes. And sometimes you persuade them not so much with the facts and with the logic, but the way in which you argue. And if you watch, I, I watch a lot of Russian television, like particularly Vesti Nedeli and these horrible Russian propaganda programs. And I think that if you are a basically a good, decent person in Russia, however much you love your country and however much you may believe that um, the West has been unfair and shock therapy was bad and, you know, or you can believe a lot of things, but as a good, decent, kind person, eventually you will find the tone of that program bad and you will start thinking, I don't want to believe the same things that Kisilyov believes. There must be something wrong there. So by arguing in a kind, decent, tolerant way, that may be the way in. Another way in is satire, just telling really good jokes. And I'm urging Radio Svoboda to restart Amensky Radio, Radio Yerevan, and collect anecdoti and rebroadcast them. Because we, in our country, in our system, we make fun of anyone. I can sit here and tell jokes about President Grivarskaiti, about Theresa May, about Donald Trump. Nothing will happen to me. If I was at the Nashi Festival in um, Lake Seliga, I can make jokes about Donald Trump and about Grivarskaiti and, 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 and about Theresa May, and that's fine, but I can't make jokes about Putin. So that's the difference. In our system, we laugh at everybody. In their system, they can only laugh at us. So let's have really good political satire in all directions, translate into Russian, and broadcast it. That will also help break this kind of mindset. Have the FAQs and all the, the facts on our side so they're there, and if they take the trouble to Google it, then they will find it. Because still in Russia, at least for now, there is no great wall of Russia preventing them accessing our information. As I said before, Wikipedia is a big battleground, and anyone here who can write in grammatical Russian, please just spend 10 minutes a week going onto Wikipedia in Russian and checking out these controversial sites. Ukrainian famine, molotov ribbentrop fact, Pact, Occupation of the Baltics, Great Terror. Because you'll find the Russian trolls are there all the time trying to put their side of the story, trying to, you know, Katyn, denial, very big one. Just look at the Polish website on Katyn and the Russian website on Katyn, and you'll see that the, the, the Katyn denialism is always creeping in on the Russian side. And I'm always encouraging my Polish friends, get in there and just apply the Wikipedia rules. Where's the source for this? Um, is this loaded language? You know, so we have, there's a constant battleground out there, and we have to get in there and fight it. But we should fight it in places like Wikipedia. I don't think there's any point in going onto Russian propaganda sites and posting comments there. That's, that's a waste of our effort. When there's neutral ground, which they're trying to invade, then we should go in there. And particularly, if you speak Russian and have, can write good grammatical Russian, then get in there and engage. The lady at the front had a question. Yeah, the last question. Yeah, can we have the microphone at the front, please? Hi, uh, I'm Zivila, and uh, since I work in journalism, I probably have a little bit more like professional question. But the thing is that we talk so much about fake news and uh, fake news in media, and it's like every single day you have at least a few stories uh, in like Western media or in Lithuanian media, it doesn't matter. But And then I just feel that I meet a lot of people who say that, oh, all you talk is fake news, and that's it. And then I have a feeling that they turn to media who never speak about it. So they turn to that probably more propagandic media. And I'm just thinking, how do we as journalists, um, uh, how should we work and not overdo it when we speak about the 
these fake news because we still should kind of re re represent it. And one more question is like, I agree that we should um, teach young peop people and kids, especially in schools, history and facts. But then uh, I also have a feeling that a lot of people who fall into traps of propaganda are people who are older generation. So how do we reach them? How we discuss with them and how do we ask them to join the discussion in general? Well, we need a whole an, another conference to answer these questions. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're great, but I'll, I'll give a very brief, um, brief, brief answers because I know we're out of time, but maybe we can follow up later on. Um, I think the first thing to recognize is most people are not that interested in the news, and the news they are interested in is the news that's about their direct world. So they want to know they want to know what happened yesterday, what's happening in their um, in their region, in their industry, in their in their lives. And our job as journalists is first of all to be quite humble and give people report the news that people actually want to read. And that may be not the news that we want to write. So we, there's a there's a, a problem there. And I um uh, and 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 we just have to have to have to accept that. I think if we can make people understand that there is a lot of fake news out there, that's already good. You know, just make people realize not everything you see on YouTube, not everything you read on the internet is true. That's already a big, a big plus if we make people um, accept that. And that's tricky because the fake news is getting better and better. And you can now produce a video. There was a, a, the University of Seattle has done a terrifying experiment where they took a lot of video of Barack Obama and they then used some software to make Barack Obama give a speech that he never gave. And when you watch it, it's like Barack Obama talking. But this is work. They just wrote some words. And he, gave the, he gives this speech. So you know, the next generation of fake news is going to be even more dangerous than what we've got at the moment. So we just have to get people to understand that there's a lot of it about. And then maybe they will switch off and just say, well, OK, I won't. You know, so long as I know that, and that I know that sources really matter, then we've already created a kind of media hygiene where people will know that stuff that looks interesting on the internet may well be fake. And you don't eat it just like you don't eat food that you find on the street. It may look nice, but you, know, you want to buy food in shops, and you want it properly wrapped, and you wash your hands before eating it. We, we kind of know how to deal with food. We should have the same sort of attitude with information. And about the older generation, this is really difficult because people feel alienated. They don't like the way the countries run. They don't like the way the sort of the discourse. And we, and I think we, you know, these social divisions which you have in your country and in my country and and so on, these all feed the Kremlin's approach. You know, the, I think that the fundamental tactic the Kremlin has is look for divisions, whether they're demographic, ethnic, religious, cultural, geographical, linguistic, religious, wherever there's a division, the Kremlin tries to exploit it and make it worse. Um, and you know, if we always keep that lens of the way of looking at our society and try and deal with those divisions, both as individuals and in whatever our professional life is, then that, li that makes it more difficult for the Kremlin. But whenever, it's very interesting, if you talk to Russians, Russians naturally, when they look at um, a society, they always seem to focus in on the divisions. And I remember even in the, in the Soviet era, they would say, when I would go to the Soviet Union and talk to communists, they would immediately start off by saying, what social class are you? So I used to say aristocratic, <laughs> which always annoyed them. Because <laughs> they thought you had to be either bourgeois or intellectual. So, but, you know, they think in these very divisive terms, and that continues through to the Putin Putinist approach. And, and, we, and we don't, you know, we, our, our society is not based on divisions. It's based on common values, common rights, common duties. And that's, I think, is the way, but that goes well beyond the scope of our talk today. But thank you for raising it. Unfortunately, our time has run out. So I invite you to thank Edward once again for coming here and for this very stimulating presentation and discussion. Thank you, Edward.
Edward will be here for, uh, he will be around for another couple of hours, so you can come to him and, uh, you know, just continue the discussion. Or you're welcome to follow me on Twitter and message me there, or to um, contact me on Facebook, or to email me, if you want to be old-fashioned. Thank you.